Well, good morning. For those of you here, we're glad you're here. If you're watching in the East Worship Center or online or over at the chapel at Lockport, we say hello to you as well. We have a lot to cover and not a lot of time to cover it. So we'll get right in. If you have a Bible, I'd ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to be talking today about a theology of pain or maybe painology. Now, we are smart creatures, us human beings. We do everything we can to avoid pain, little things throughout the day to avoid any sort of painful experience, and I think those are all good ideas. We do little things, whether we're thinking about them or whether we're not thinking about them. We put a seatbelt on when we get into our car. We try not to say mean things to people that we love or to our boss. Um, We try not to run with scissors, if at all possible, although that is a temptation for many. Um, and, and even some involuntary things that we, we have. If, if, we're, if we're touching a hot stove, we don't even think about it. We just pull our hand back. It's not like there's this conversation going on between our head and our hand. And this is an unpleasurable experience. In fact, the temperature has reached such levels that it will incur very serious pain if we do not retract the hand at once. That doesn't happen. It's just, boom, recoil. So we try to avoid pain at all costs, but there are some crazy people in the world who think that pain has some value. I mean, we hear Marines talk about pain is weakness leaving the body, right? Um, That's just, that's strange to me because we do everything in our power to avoid pain on a daily basis. And here you have some people saying that, hey, there's some value to pain. In fact, pain is actually worth it. And you can probably tell this just by looking at me, it's just from my sheer size, but one of my role models is Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, uh, and just speaking from personal experiences, you don't get arms as big as ours, mine and Arnold's, that is. Uh, you don't get arms as big as we do without some serious pain going through those repetitions. It's just a very serious thing. And actually, I found Arnold talking about pain, and what he said was pretty interesting. Take a look right here. Listen. The body is not used to uh, maybe the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th rep with a certain weight. So that makes the body grow then, going through this pain barrier, experiencing uh, pain in your muscles and aching and just then go on and go on and then go on. And this last two or three or four repetitions, that's what makes actually the muscle then grow. And that uh, divides then one from a champion and one from not being a champion. If you can go through this pain barrier, you make it to be a champion. If you can't go through, forget it. And that's what most people lack, is on this, having the guts. The guts to go in and just say, I go through and I don't care what happens. You know, it aches and if I fall down, I, I have no fear of fainting in a gym. Because I know it's, it, it, it could happen. I threw up many times while I was working out, but it doesn't matter because it's all worth it. This might be my last opportunity to speak here, so I was like, hey, we got to make it good. (laughs) The first and last appearance of Arnold Schwarzenegger at the chapel. But if you were listening and or reading, because we had to subtitle it so that you could understand what he was saying, because most of us don't speak Austrian, um, (laughs) whatever he was saying, if you listened, he said, there's this pain barrier, and if you can get through the pain barrier, growth follows. What an interesting thought. Almost unnatural, isn't it? That if you could get through this pain barrier, this wall of pain, that it would be worth it because growth would be not far behind. Now, without making any sort of judgment, and I don't know the former governor well, um, but I'm just guessing that he probably did not get his idea of pain from God's word, just a hunch. And yet... What he said was something very significant that's going to sound an awful lot like something we're going to read in 2 Corinthians 4. But you know, we're not going to consult Arnold on our pain uh, because our pain maybe runs a little bit deeper than that. What we need is a theology of pain. Theology comes from two Greek words, one meaning God and one meaning word or saying. We need God's sayings about our pain because we are full of Oprah sayings about our pain, of Dr. Phil sayings about our pain, of Dr. Oz sayings about our pain. And yet, we know that they have just as much pain as we do. And yet, as much of their sayings as we have in our ears and in our minds, we still have our own pain. 
and no answers for them. So we don't need any other sayings about pain. We need God sayings about pain because he's the only one qualified to speak to it. So even though we've, we've had a, a spirit of worship and been praying throughout this service, we need to ask God to speak to us today because without him, this is pointless. Pray with me, will you? Father, I'm just a mouthpiece and a broken one at that. Forgive me for the times when I've allowed fresh water and salt water to flow from the same stream and not been pure in my words as, as I use them for your glory. I'm as guilty as anybody of that. There's nothing that makes me qualified to speak your truth except you speaking through me because I need this and we need this because pain is very near to us and we need to hear from you today. Will you speak to us? We will respond. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. None of us is far from pain, and that's a theme that the scripture picks up on. And not just Paul, where we will be camping out in 2 Corinthians in just a minute, but actually a lot, or most of the biblical authors picked up on that. Moses, you know, who wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, he also wrote Psalm chapter 90, and he said this very interesting thing in Psalm chapter 90. It's on the screens. Seventy years are given to us. Some even live to 80. But the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we fly away. What Moses says is, you know, a good long life, 70, 80, maybe more years. He himself lived longer. But he said a good life, 70 or 80 years. But even the best of those years have pain in them. Pain is very near to the human condition. And that's something that Moses knew. And, and he knew this. We could study his life, but we won't this morning. But pain can take on many different forms. It could be physical. It could be emotional. It could be mental. It could be relational. The many different kinds of pain are never far from us. We know that. So it's really not a matter of if, but a matter of when. And that's not designed to be fatalistic or for us to say, well, oh, well, life's not really worth living not that at all, because where we're headed, again, remember, this is a theology of pain. This is a God saying of pain, and we're not going to leave here this morning without hope. So what we need is an unnatural, in fact, a supernatural concept of pain, because we still have this pain, and we don't know what to do with it, and it still hurts, and we still wake up broken, and we still wake up empty. So we need to hear from God and listen to God's words through the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting with verse 16. He says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are be being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now if we're looking at this text... I see three contrasts that the Apostle Paul makes in this passage, this very short passage. Because what the Apostle Paul is doing is he's taking our typical vantage point of pain and he's lining it up with a godly perspective on pain. And what Paul wants to do is show us the differences and let the, let the chips fall where they may and then we'll have something to do with it. But he's, he shows us three contrasts, one in each verse. The first one is this. He contrasts the outward decay versus inward renewal. That's in verse 16. We just read it. And that's not too surprising. There's nothing surprising there. The aging process, we're familiar with it. Uh, the, the word they're wasting away in our text, verse 16, is the same word Jesus used to describe the things, the earthly treasures. Remember that conversation? Don't store up for yourself earthly treasures where raw, uh, <laughs> rust and moth destroy that word destroy, the slow degradation. It's a slow decay, this aging process. We, all, we know that all too well. Some of you probably woke up this morning knowing that it's going to rain. You got something in your knee. I don't know if you're tapped into Don Paul and you got 844 right here, you know, but there's something you know, and that wasn't always there, but it's new now. You, you've got that. Maybe you're looking in the mirror this morning and you, you said, hmm, there's a new crease in my skin and my forehead up here. I mean, these things happen to us, it even happened to me. As young as I am, I'm 24. I can't even dunk like I used to. And so you feel my pain, obviously. 
But Paul says that for a Christian, there's more than just the outward decay going on. See, er normal people, everyday people, just look at the outside, and they can only see the outward decay. But for a follower of Christ, he says something significant and something supernatural is happening. We are being renewed inwardly day by day. There's an inward renewal that he's contrasting with the outward decay. And Paul said something to that effect earlier in this letter, just on the other page in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. It says this, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So there's nothing really surprising here. You get that idea, don't you? There's, there's outward decay, but there's an inward renewal. And we understand that as followers of Christ. So nothing too surprising in verse 16. But then we come to verse 17, and we see the second contrast. Paul says, the momentary pain with eternal glory. And this is where we push back. This is where we tense up. Because we might be so inclined to say, Paul, what do you know about my pain? Paul, what do you know about the pain that I feel? Physical, mental, emotional, relational, whatever it is. Paul, how dare you if we were so bold? Paul, how dare you call my pain light and momentary? And maybe if, if we're just in our flesh here, we're like, I kind of want to knock Paul's lights out because he has no idea what I'm going through. And then after we've sent a few blows Paul's way, we turn our attention to God. And we say, God, this is, this is your word to my pain. This is what you have to say to my pain. This is your word, isn't it? This is your inspired word. And that's what you've allowed Paul to say to my pain is it's light and it's momentary. God, how could you? Because you know better. You know the pain that I feel. You know the pain that's been weighing on me. It's anything but light. And the, the pain that I've been carrying these many years, it's anything but momentary. God, how could you? And we begin to question whether or not Paul, but more importantly, God, knows anything of pain. Well, let's deal with Paul first, and then we'll look at God. Paul knew way too much about pain. Later in this same book, in the book of in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul describes for us the amount of pain that he experienced in his life. Take a look at these verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I'm more. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned to death. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea, just treading water, just treading water a night and a day. How'd you like that? I'm sure there was no sea creatures interested in con consuming Paul that night. Uh, I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and I've been naked. Besides everything else, oh, by the way, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. So who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin or into trouble and I do not inwardly burn? I do not empathize. Paul says, all of this physical beating that I've taken on my body as I've pursued carrying the message of the gospel to the nations, this entire physical beating that is just relentless, and oh, by the way, I have the daily concern of all the churches, these young fledgling Christians who don't have leather-bound copies of the scripture on their coffee table. And so he's concerned about the heresy that could creep in and infect this early church. And so he's constantly concerned for them. And he can't just shoot an email to the pastor at Corinth. Hey, everything good? Still on the whole one gospel thing? He can't do that. He has to, he has to pray and trust and wait. So Paul has all of this physical torment. He has all this emotional pain. But I think that his pain didn't stop there. Because remember, he was a devout Jewish man. He was actually a Pharisee. Paul was actually born Saul, and he was born into the home, the son of a Pharisee. His parents were devout Jewish believers. And they, they trusted in the one true God. 
or so they claimed. And yet when this Saul came home and he was now Paul, they threw him out of their house. They said, you're a blasphemer. Paul was anything but. They thought he was abandoning the faith. He was doing anything but that. And while he tried to reason, listen, imagine Paul's pain as he tries to reason with his dad through the scriptures that Jesus is Messiah and his dad throws him out of his house. The feeling of pain doesn't get any easier just because he was probably an adult by the time this happened. Just because he wasn't a kid doesn't mean it was any less painful. But as a Pharisee, when he was Saul, it'd be more than likely that he was married. It would be very uncommon for a Pharisee to not be married. So we, it stands to reason that he was. And yet by the time he starts writing letters to the churches, he's single. And we know from 1 Corinthians 6 and 7, he would never initiate divorce because it's un becoming of a believer. So what we can stand to reason is that either Paul's wife passed away or the second more likely option is she divorced him. She left him. When Saul came home from that trip to Damascus and he was now Paul, and Paul did the same thing. He tried to reason with his wife, who was no doubt a devout Jewish person as well, and he tried to reason with his sweetheart. Jesus is Messiah. We could share in this joy together. And for her to say, get out and don't come home, to slam the door behind him after throwing a few belongings after him into the street. And Paul would wind up in house arrest in Rome, dying without the one he had pledged his life to. Do you think Paul knew something of pain? But even more comforting than the fact that we have one who can sympathize with us like Paul is the fact that we have a God who does. That's far better. You see, imagine God, imagine the father watching, looking over to his son who's hanging on a cross for sinful humanity. And imagine the father as his heart is burning with wrath and love, justice and mercy all at the same time, but he's pouring out this concentrated judgment for sin on his son. And imagine the father, his heart breaking as he must turn his face away and his son is crying out after him, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you think the father knows something about pain? But maybe that's too distant for you. So picture Jesus. The book of Hebrews tells us the things that Jesus endured. Look at Hebrews 2.18. Because he himself suffered. He, he experienced immense pain. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. In Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, verses you probably know. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Our God is no stranger to pain because Jesus is God in the flesh. So picture Jesus and the physical, mental, emotional, relational pain that he was in. Mentally, as he hung on that cross, he was drained, hadn't slept since Wednesday, was kept all night in a mockery of the Jewish judicial system. He was drained mentally. Imagine what he felt relationally as he watched every one of his disciples turn their backs on him and run away. And, oh, by the way, the one that betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Do you think Jesus knew relational pain? Do you think he knew emotional pain? as his, he's in the garden and his hands are shaking from the tasks that's in front of him and so he clasps them together as he prays, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass. And Psalm 22, which Jesus quoted from on the cross, says, my heart has turned to wax within me. It has melted away. Emotional pain, emotional torment, but physically worse than any of us have ever known. Spikes. Not nails, not nails that we hang a picture frame with, but spikes driven into his hands and his feet. Thorns. We recoil if we get too close to a thorn bush. And these thorns were rammed into his head, his scalp, and his temple, and his forehead. Blood running down mixed with tears, no doubt, into his swollen face. 
which had been beaten beyond recognition, first by the chief priests and then by the Roman guards, and his back, which was ripped open. From the lashing that he'd received all morning before going to the cross, aggravated every time he drew a breath because many people who were crucified died of asphyxiation because they couldn't pull up to draw a breath. And yet there's Jesus pressing his back into that splintering wood just to draw a single breath that would last and satisfy maybe a few moments. Do you think that we have a God who does not have any clue about pain? No, our God experienced the worst of pain so that you and I wouldn't have to. Remember Isaiah 53, by his wounds we are healed. We'll come back to that thought in a bit. So this light and momentary pain contrasted with an eternal glory, our pain we sometimes view as standing between us and eternity. But in fact, our pain is preparing us for eternity. That's what this verse says. But listen to John Piper as he speaks about these verses. And the point is not that the afflictions merely precede the glory. They help produce the glory. There is a real causal connection between how we endure hardship now and how much we will be able to enjoy the glory of God in the ages to come. Not one moment of patient pain is wasted. Thank you, John Piper. It's all worth it. Our light and momentary troubles, Paul says, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And maybe we get a glimpse of that glory on this earth because, as we've already read from 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are being transformed into this glory every day, day by day. But maybe God is looking for us to walk through our pain in a way that brings him more glory, not less. Because sometimes, if we're honest, we use our pain, no matter how severe, we use our pain to draw attention to ourselves. Woe is me. And that's not to minimize the pain, by the way. Never would I ever do that, nor would the scriptures. But if we're honest, it sometimes feels good to have someone feel sorry for us. And maybe what God is looking for us to do is to catch a glimpse of his glory now. This glory that outweighs our light and momentary affliction. This glory that is heavy and it tips the scales You know, the Hebrew word for glory actually communicated a sense of weight, heaviness, this eternal weight of glory. Man, that's good. So maybe God is looking for us to walk through our pain in a way that points people to him and not to us. Because you don't know what God wants to do with your pain. You don't. That's why you have to trust him. So Paul, he contrasts momentary pain with eternal Glory, And then there's a third thing. Things seen versus things unseen. Verse verse 18 again. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary or transient, but what is unseen is eternal. We could also translate it this way. So our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all seeing as we are people who fix our eyes on the unseen. Since we are people who have our eyes fixed on the unseen, this is what our pain is producing, glory. Because not all who experience pain are producing for themselves glory, but only those who have the capacity to see Jesus for who he is, to see him in the midst of our pain, realizing that he experienced pain First to identify with us, yes, but also so that we didn't have to experience the worst of it. But not everyone has that capacity. In this very, in this very same book, in, in chapter 4 actually, Paul says that the minds of unbelievers are blinded so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. They can't see him. 
But we fix our eyes not on what is seen, not on what we can grasp, but what is, on, what is unseen. And this is a theme running throughout the entire New Testament. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Or maybe some translations say fix your affections on things above. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And then 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. You picking up on this theme? For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And then Hebrews 12, verses you know. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Same phrase that began our text in 2 Corinthians 4.16. So that you will not lose heart. If you've got your eyes fixed on the unseen, you will not lose heart. No matter how difficult the pain is, no matter how unbearable the pain is, you will not lose heart. You will not give up. You won't faint. And here's what God wants us to do. He wants us to start viewing our pain through the lens of eternity, through his lens. It's difficult for us, though, isn't it? Because we are temporal. We're constrained by time. And so thinking about eternity is difficult. Someone once said that for beings like us who are constrained by time to describe eternity, it's like trying to describe the color white using words that only mean black. It, it, it's, it's almost impossible for us because we can't even grasp what that eternity is, but God wants us to fix our eyes on him, and that will give us a perspective because we will start to see our pain through his lens, and here's what he wants to do. Here's what he wants to show us. He wants our pain to drive us to him, not away from him. But many people do the exact opposite. Because they've only got their eyes fixed on what they can see, they allow their pain to drive them away from God, not to him. Because it's, God, how could you? God, how could you let this happen? How could you allow this into my life? God, God why? And we ask why, and we ask why, and why? is actually the wrong question. Because what God wants to ask us is what? God, God wants us to ask him what? God, what do you want to teach me through this pain? God, what do you want to teach me through my pain? C.S. Lewis said it best. God whispers to us in our pleasures he speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And what God wants to do is he wants to get your attention. He wants to shake you out of a stupor. And he wants to pull you in close to himself. But when we've, got, when we've become so consumed on the things that are, that the things that we can see, and not on the things that are unseen, or rather him who is unseen, when we've got such a myopic view, we miss this completely. And so what God wants to do is he wants to shake us and, and rattle us and bring us back because he wants to rouse the deaf world and if he needs to use pain to do that, maybe he will. This is probably the hardest lesson I've ever had to learn because I wish that I was just speaking from theory but I'm not. Some of you know that I have a big brother. His name's Mark, eight years older than me. Some of you know that he passed away last May of 2011, unexpectedly. And I'd be lying to you if I said the grieving process was over and that it didn't hurt, because it does. Because he wasn't just my big brother, he was also my best man. And one of, the, one of the last memories that 
I have with him is actually at my wedding. And it's funny because if you didn't know anything about my brother, he was, he was in the United States Navy. And uh, let's just say he was kind of a tough guy, all right? Um, he wasn't just mopping the floor of some ship, okay? He was a special warfare uh, combatant crewman, which is kind of like a Navy SEAL, but pretty much off the grid. Uh, and we still don't know to this day all that he did, and that kind of makes me happy inside. Um, because I just like to think when I'm having a bad day, maybe he was uh, doing some good to defend our country's freedom, and he was. But he was a tough guy, right? I mean, he was a Navy guy. They're tough. Uh, And so here he is standing next to me as my best man, and my wife and I are standing there exchanging our vows, and we hear this this whimpering, this, this, this crying. And I assumed it was my wife's baby brother who was 10 at the time because everybody was crying except for Gabe and I. We were just like, hey, this is great. We're, we're just excited this is finally happening. So there we're standing exchanging vows and I can't see behind me, but all of a sudden I see a smirk on my wife's face. And then I hear a, a very masculine throat clear. And I realized it was my 30-year-old brother who, was, who went through Navy SEAL training, went through the special warfare training, and he is bawling like a baby. I mean, it was just one of those things that we still watch the DVD, and, and we just have to laugh because it was so, it was so funny to us. Uh, and, it, and we have many, many good memories like that. And my brother and I had an interesting relationship because he lived out of town, and so we didn't talk a lot on the phone, but we would really just text each other a lot and Maybe if we saw something ridiculous, we'd take a picture of it, you know, secretly take a picture of it with our cell phone and send it to each other. Because as you can probably tell about me, I barely come up for a breath when I'm talking, and he's the same way. So it was an hour and a half before any phone conversation could be over. So we had to stick to texting more often than not. And so if, if, if he was at Walmart and he saw a minivan, like, parked up on a curb in some weird way, like, he's just like, who is this guy, you know, and he sends it to me. Or if I was at the gym and I saw a guy whose upper body was way disproportionate to his lower body, I'd try to, sni- you know, snipe a picture of that and send it to him because we just loved little things like that. And, I, and I'll be honest, God has done, God has done amazing things in, in this process which is what it is. But do you, know what, do you know what hurts the most? What hurts the most about that pain is, is, is when I'll see something that I know would make him laugh and I, and I, can't, I can't send it to him. I can't. My brother's probably laughing now because I told the story about crying, and now here I am crying. He got me back. But I can't, I, I can't, I can't do it. And after he passed, I took some time off of work and just stayed home. Gabe and I shared memories about my brother, and it was really good. And one morning, I woke up really early, didn't have to be at work, six o'clock in the morning. Gabe doesn't know that there's a six o'clock in the morning, so I was by myself, And I got my coffee, and I got my Bible, and I went and sat on our back porch. It was in May. And I knew where to go in the Scripture because I was in seminary, and I was prepared for things like that. So if you're grieving, you go to 2 Corinthians 1. It's just just part of the thing. So I'm reading in 2 Corinthians 1 about the God of all comfort. And I kept reading, and I read chapter 2, and I read chapter 3, started to read chapter 4, where we are today. And I read, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And then verse 17, For our light and momentary trouble. And I just lost it on our back porch, just weeping. Because I said, God... How could you? How could you say that this is light? How could you say it's momentary? How could, how could you say that? And I, didn't, I didn't finish reading. And I don't remember when, and I wish that the story ended with the sky splitting open and, 
and God speaking an answer or spelling something out in my cereal, but he, he didn't. And, and it felt, to be honest, like God was being silent. But what I now realize is that he had already spoken, and I wasn't interested. I wasn't ready. I didn't want to see what he had to say. Because I was viewing my pain through what was seen. But sometime later, I picked this passage up again. And I finished the verse. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And I realized what God was saying is, you haven't changed your perspective. You're only looking at your pain through the lens of what is seen, but I want you to see things from where I'm sitting. Because no pain is wasted. We could rattle off Romans 8.28 all day long, can't we? But it's another thing to actually have to believe it. And one of the things that comforted me the most as this process, as I'm still working through this process, was the words of a guy named Job. You see, Job suffered a ton in his lifetime. He's, he's like, he would be like one of the champions of Old Testament suffering. And yet he made this very interesting statement in Job chapter 13, verse 15. Take a look. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So I realized the question, remember, not why, but what. God, what are you trying to teach me? And it was this. God asking me, do you really trust me? Do you really believe that I know best? Do you really trust that I'm looking for your good? Do you trust that this isn't all there is? Or is this just going through the motions? Is this just convenient Christianity? Is this just I'll walk with you when it's convenient, God? Though he, even if he kills me, I'll still trust him. God is looking for us to be people who trust him because we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is looking out for our best interest. Again, I have to go to Lewis on this. Look at the words of C.S. Lewis. We are not necessarily doubting that God will do the best for us. We are just wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. Leave that up for a second. We are not necessarily doubting that God will do the best for us. We are wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. You see, your pain is not wasted. Right now, you feel like you have a pain barrier that you can't get through, that you can't get past, and it, it may be even defining you today. And what you need to realize is that that pain, with your gaze fixed on Jesus, is achieving for you a glory that tips the scales over. Because your pain on your worst day if we concentrated that pain into the span of time, maybe we, it would last 10, 10 days, maybe 10 years. If we just concentrated your pain and packed it all in tightly, maybe it would last, maybe it'll last a few decades at most. But in comparison with eternity, it's a blip. Because for those who have fixed their gaze on Jesus, fix their eyes on him, this is just the beginning. There's way more to come. And here's the good news. We said it already. Jesus experienced the worst of our pain so that this life could be the conclusion of pain for us. Because, sin, because man sinned, pain entered the world. But God didn't just say, well, oh well, they ruined the plan. He decided to do something about it. And so he allowed this pain to 
have some redemptive value, but not without his son's sacrifice. But Jesus experienced more pain concentrated on him in the matter of hours that he hung on the cross, more pain than any of us will ever experience in a lifetime. And he did that so that our pain would not have to run into the age to come. That our torment would end when we draw our last breath. But for those who reject Jesus, who say, no thanks, I'm fine, or who allow their pain to drive them away from God and say, I could never worship a God who allows pain in this world, their torment will only intensify Their pain will only worsen. But for those who are in Christ, it ends. And God peels back the veil when we stand in his presence and he says, look at all I brought you through. That wasn't wasted. That had value. It was preparing you for this. And maybe if you're here and you would say that pain would be one of those things. The pain, all this pain and suffering in the world, I could never worship a God who allows pain and suffering. Okay. But let's be clear. This God that you're talking about, you've invented him. Because this God does not just allow pain and suffering and sit back. As we've already talked about, he experienced pain for us. One theologian, John Stott, said this very important thing. I could never myself believe in a God if it were not for the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it? Jesus laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. Our sufferings become more manageable in light of his. There is still a question mark against human suffering, but over it we boldly stamp another mark, the cross, which symbolizes divine suffering. So if your last excuse for rejecting God has been the pain that's in this world, let's be clear. You're rejecting a God who experienced pain so that your pain would end in this lifetime. And if that's your decision, let me just tell you, you're making a mistake. But for the rest of us, we have this pain. Maybe we're believers in Christ and And we experience pain, physical, mental, emotional, relational, whatever it is, maybe a combination. And I can't know what you're walking through, specifically. Only you and God really know what that is. But for some of us, we allow our pain to become our God. And it is more important to us than the awe-inspiring worship of the God who loves us. And today, we need to smash those idols and break them into little pieces. Because this pain in light of eternity, man, we're not denying that it exists. We're not denying that it hurts, but we are prioritizing it. Because God, he's good, and he wants what's best for you. But he, he needs you to view your pain through his eyes. Will you pray with me? If you can, I'd ask that you not leave. And just out of respect for those around you, if you would just maybe bow your heads and close your eyes if that's helpful to you. We'll be gone in a minute. If you're here at the Cross Point campus, whether in this main worship center or over in the East Worship Center, after we're dismissed, if you would come by the fireside room, we'd love to get a chance to meet you, but more importantly, if you don't know this Jesus who experienced pain for you, we would be remiss if we did not give you an opportunity to meet him before you leave today. We're not signing you up for anything. We just want to put something in your hand that will help you know what it means to follow Jesus. If you're at the Lockport campus, Chad will be up in a minute just to close things out and offer you direction there as well. And if you're watching online, you can Click that tab, knowing Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its timeless, eternal relevance. There's nothing I could do to make this relevant to us. But because your spirit, your your living spirit that you've infused into the text, as you breathed out, you breathed out the words of scripture. 
we realize that you're still speaking to us right where we are. But also, Father, we thank you that we have a God who is very near to our pain, who is not content to sit back in heaven and allow us to go down this path only to carry into an eternity of torment separated from you, but that you made a way for this this light and momentary pain to be all that there is, that it doesn't have to continue in, into the age to come if we would but turn from our sin and turn to you. God, for those of us who are your children, by faith in Jesus Christ, give us that eternal perspective that we need when there's days that are just tougher than others, when it's, it's hard to get out of bed. Grant us your grace. Thank you that you are a God of comfort and a God of love. And we know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, you will do what's best for us, even if it's painful. And when we finally stand before you one day, we'll realize it was all worth it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week.